Hello, this is Dr. Llewellyn Eisen, and we are back with another video lecture on medicine and religion in the Roman Empire. And today we're going to talk, or at least I'm going to talk, about folk healers, the third part of our three-part consideration of the types of healers in late antiquity. So um, before we launch into talking about the person of Jesus as a folk healer, we want to think about the context within which Jesus and the healing methods of Jesus are taking place. So Jesus is not the founder of Christianity. Christianity is a religion that will be founded on the work and activity of the person of Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew. And Palestinian Judaism was a client state that had been subject to Rome in the Roman Empire from the year 63 before the Common Era. So 63 years before the year zero, Judea became a client state. And this was problematic for um, Jewish culture, for Palestinian Judaism. And Judaism is an ethno-religious community. Judaism is an ancient uh, ethical monotheism that is concerned with a covenantal relationship between the people of Israel and their God. They are concerned deeply with community and communal relations, with ethical behavior, um, with autonomous rule. So being a client state is, is deeply problematic. And then also with uh, a very significant and rich ritual history. So Jesus lived in the first century and medical procedures and medical care in the first century of the Roman Empire had some qualities about it that are probably at this point very familiar to you based on what we've already read and what we've already thought about. There were some medical deities in the Roman Empire uh, to whom Romans appealed. For example, Mars was appealed to for protection from the plague, and the goddess Carna was appealed to for care for vital organs or digestives or stomach disorders or disorders of uh, interior parts of the body that might be somewhat mysterious to the average person. This isn't a statue here of Carna. Here's a, here's a Roman woman that She's hard to find images of, so we'll just go with that. That's a little bit more attractive than just a votive with intestines on it. And, of course, the Romans had their own form of Asclepius. They were very happy to adopt the figure of Asclepius with his attendant children. But you can notice here in this Roman statue of Asclepius, you can see some familiar imagery, right? He's got his traditional staff with the healing serpent. But notice that his facial characteristics are a little bit different. He doesn't have the traditional beard and he has a Roman hairstyle. So the Romans were, of course, willing to adopt and incorporate other uh, um, regional groups, gods, into their pantheon. But they certainly made changes so that the ideas or the images were palatable to them. So appealing to the deities for... Um, for care, for medical care and medical relief or bodily relief was certainly something that Romans did in a way that was very similar to the Greeks. There was a considerable suspicion, though, about the medical profession. Pliny the Elder in his Natural History will write that Romans were without physicians, but not without medicine. It was not medicine itself that the forefathers condemned, but the medical profession, chiefly because they refused to pay fees to profiteers in order to save their lives. And so you can see in this quote um, a deep suspicion about the actual career or the profession of doctor or physician. So where then is health and healing going to take place for a Roman? Where is health and healing going to take place in the first century in the Roman Empire in the era in which Jesus will live as a folk healer? It will take place at the local level. It will take place through folk remedies as allowed by the head of the family, the paterfamilias. 
And this is, of course, a very gendered term because we're dealing with a gendered world at this particular point in time. So folk remedies, as allowed by the head of the family, would include things like diet and fasting, supplications and prayers, rituals or particular particular sacrifices that are um, that sometimes might be simple and sometimes might be elaborate. Things like magic or alchemy or astrology, alchemy being really the um, foremother of pharmacology. And then, of course, herbs and other kinds of uh, pharmacological treatments that are put together. And what do these treatments look like? What might that what might that be? Um, a lot of folk medicine pharmacology is plant-based. It's fairly non-traditional. It usually uh, means that there's no formal training or it might be learned through an apprenticeship. And very often it's rural and it can be as simple as the ingestion of a plant or the creation of a, of a tea or a drink. Like here we have some ginger tea, which we know is, is good for, med, uh, for, um, for indigestion. Here's some apple cider vinegar. This is folk medicine that is still used. Some people claim that folk medicine, excuse me, that apple cider vinegar as a form of folk medicine is good for lowering blood pressure for people with diabetes. I use apple cider vinegar to clean my floors and my floors are very clean so I can assure you that it works well for that. Um, this is St. John's wort and it is still treated to this day for depression. So there are various forms of folk medicine or plant-based medicine that are non-traditional um, and yet they are actually quite traditional in that, in that they have existed for thousands of years. And we also want to keep in mind that folk medicine doesn't always involve the ingestion of a particular plant-based type of medicine, but also can include words. It can include simple things like a conversation or a touch or comfort. Folk medicine is deeply grounded medicinal approaches to the basic human health needs of people. So the figure of Jesus of Nazareth, a first century Palestinian Jew, as a folk healer, um, this is a person to whom we wish to now draw our attention. So Judaism in the first century was unlike the Romans and Greeks in a few ways in that it there was only one divine being or there is only one divine being in the pantheon of Judaism. So if you've spent any time reading passages in the Hebrew Bible, which I would not expect you to have done up to this point, you would be aware that there's a struggle within Judaism to remain or maintain a monotheism, a soul worship and veneration of a single deity. So whether or not the ancient Israelites were able to do that well or not is irrelevant. The point is in the first century that Judaism is largely distinct from its Roman and Greek neighbors in that while Jews might acknowledge that there are other deities, primarily Judaism acknowledges only one divine being. But it is like Romans and Greeks in that sin and disease are in fact linked in some way. For Judaism, sin entered the world at what's known as the fall, and consequently, when sin entered the world at the fall, the fall of humanity, the fall of an individual to sin, at that point suffering was introduced into the world. And so suffering means that people will be ill, people will experience pain, they will experience sorrow, and they will experience death. And so, to a certain degree, these things cannot be helped and they cannot be avoided, but there are remedies to some of the less, lesser forms of suffering that an individual might encounter. So how does Jewish healthcare differ from that of the Greek and the Roman? in four different ways that are worth pointing out. First of all, for Judaism, moral failure is at the root of illness. And this is something that is not actually intrinsic to Judaism. It is an element 
of the theology that is learned while the Jews are in captivity. So the idea of moral failure at the root of illness is something that Judaism will inherit in part from uh, Persian religion, from Zoroastrianism. A second way in which Jewish healthcare, healthcare differs from Greek and Roman is that illness is seen as very often, not always, but very often as punishment for disobedience of the law. A third way in which Jewish healthcare differs from Greek and Roman is that the holy person has direct access to that which is holy and is also holy. So a holy person who's able to assist someone in their healthcare needs is able to do so because they have direct access to the divine nature. And so consequently, that means that the holy person is also holy. It doesn't mean that they're divine, but it means that they have some kind of deep connection to that which is divine. And then finally, there's an emphasis on communal charity that you are going to see consistently in the Mark text that you'll be reading for, um, for this lesson. And you're not going to see this element of communal charity as clearly or as explicitly in Greek and Roman texts. So we want to remember that Jesus himself was not the founder of Christianity, but Christianity emerges out of what's known as the Jesus movement. The Jesus movement was a nonviolent, first century, rural, Jewish, messianic movement, that's quite a list, I know, that was in opposition to a few elements of Roman culture. One of the, way, one of the things that the Jesus movement was in opposition to was Roman injustice and political occupation. As you recall from the beginning of this lecture, Christianity emerges within a Jewish culture and Jewish theology in Palestine within the Roman Empire. And the occupation, the political occupation of Palestine was deeply problematic for many Jewish groups. The, Jewish, the Jesus movement was also in opposition to Roman social values regarding who in society deserved care. Roman, the Roman uh, Empire was in many ways successful because it was very good at keeping people apart from each other. It was very good at organizing society around in-groups and out-groups and by keeping the bulk of society oppressed. So all those fantastic uh, Roman roads, those great Roman buildings, the great Roman systems that actually worked very well, the fantastic Roman army or military, these were all effective systems because Roman values argued that there were certain people who were privileged and others who were not. The Jesus movement was in all in opposition to also to powerful Jewish agents of Roman rule. It was true that there were some elements of Jewish society that benefited by Roman occupation and the Jesus movement was in fact in opposition to Jewish elements of Jewish society who favored Roman rule. And then finally the Jesus movement was in opposition to the fear of arbitrary deities. Remember that one of the qualities of private religious life in the Roman Empire was the fact that you have a variety of deities to whom you can appeal and it's not always clear what your answer is going to be or why. <laughs>